Let's welcome everybody to another episode of Caravan Sarai to kind of give people who are new, especially our guests, a bit of context about what we're doing here today. We are we are basically uh, setting up a little, we call it like a station. The Caravan Sarai back in the days of the Silk Road was a kind of a point where travelers on their road to somewhere would stop and rest and they would share stories with other travelers and, and lessons and perspectives and they would leave that place better than when they came in. So this is our digital version of that, the modern version. People who are on the journeys of their own, how can we learn from their stories and hopefully uh, take whatever lessons they might have learned from theirs and kind of imbue it in our own. Uh, we are already now two weeks in and it's become part of our Wednesday evening. We've had some amazing guests and this week is no different. I'm kind of, there's a little bit of like, a, a little bit of fear because these are two girls who like I, I like a lot but kind of terrify me at the same time um and keeping them under control for a period of an hour is something that I've been uh, dreading but also really looking forward to it because I can imagine it's going to be super super entertaining um before I introduce the two guests today I also want to give some few house rules again remember everyone knows this already but this is a respectful place any ideas or perspectives shared should be done in a way that is respectful and positive and with the intention of all of us learning from if you have any questions then you have to message me now right you're going to message me privately on the little chat box on the right and if you want to share your question in public do a little brackets and write public at the end of your question. If you want to share it in private or ask, have me ask the question for you, then write private at the end of your question. Um, other than that, I think we're good to go. Now, the two guests I have today are really, really uh, good friends who I've known over the last two or three years. They are people who have become cultural institutions for a lot of young Muslims growing up here in Britain um, because of uh, how public this whole family has been. Now I'm gonna start with Dina. Dina is a girl who probably a lot of people will recognize as a YouTube star. She's made content now for over, I think it's been 10 years, but she has become probably one of the most successful, outgoing and brutally honest people that the internet has had the privilege of listening to. She says it as it is, and we love her for that. Uh, the second guest today is her twin sister, Tusi, who equally is an incredible blogger. She's a traveler. She's a multifaceted, super talented girl who I've had the privilege of getting to know really well over the last couple of years. Um, Tusi is, uh, used to be in finance, but then she saw an opportunity in the coding world and she took it and now she kind of travels all over the world creating programs for clients and just generally one of the most woke intelligent and sophisticated girls i've had the fortune to meet through my life now i'm very lucky uh to introduce them today dina to say hi to everybody hi dina you're on mute <laughs> dina, you have to unmute yourself dina oh, i didn't even know i muted myself how's it going <laughs> Hey. How's it going? How you been? I'm so excited. You know why I'm excited? Because I know you're both like shitting yourselves right now. I'm so nervous. Well, I didn't think I was going to be shitting myself, but now I've come in here. I can see all these people at the top. And I'm like, oh, yeah. shit, I didn't know. It's quite this intimidating. This. And all wearing suits and they're all kind of strapped up and blah, yeah, blah, blah. This, we're, is, we're, this we're is the team. This is team. This is team sabotage the Turkeys. This is quite scary. I'll oh, fuck off. <laughs> so basically, like I've had like a group of people coming today to kind of put you on spikes so we can punish your family for all of the bad stuff it's done in the past. <laughs> it's not funny, Ned. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, how you been? How's isolation? Barely surviving because. The kids, I know I keep banging on about all oh, kids, kids, but it's hard work. I'm up every day at like 6 a.m. fasting, running around after two kids and trying to stay sane and trying to get work done. It's virtually impossible. Yeah, no, I'm pretty impressed by that, considering you are also one of the biggest kids in that house as well. I feel sorry for I feel, I feel sorry for your kids to have to put up with you. I wasn't ready for witty. On your regular bits. The bats. There's a lot more where that came from today. <laughs> no, look, we, we haven't got much time, and I really want to kind of get in the crux of this really quickly. All right? Wait, now, Dina, do you remember where we first met? Actually, I don't I think, think it was I our do, first I time. Do, yeah, YouTube event. Okay, cool. So we were at this YouTube event. I'll, I'll, I'll paint the picture. Lots of people, a lot of these YouTube events, there's lots of networking that needs to be had. Lots of different creators, but also staff at the YouTube. And I'm talking and I'm doing my thing and I'm having conversations with everybody. You in the room. Uh, Dina, we made an agreement that I would speak <laughs> and then you would keep quiet. Room, like it does. <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. So I'm, you know, being friendly. I'm chatting to everyone, trying to get to know people. And then I sit on this chair and sat on next to me is Dina. And I look at Dina and she looks back at me and she's like, Oh, you love this shit, don't you? 
I'm like, what do you what do you mean? Like she's like, you know, all this kind of all this kind of like mingling stuff. You're like, you just really like it, right? And I'm like, uh, like yeah, it's like these people are nice. They just want to come and say hi. And she's like, oh, I just hate it. Like, I just can't do it. I feel really uncomfortable. And I'm like, Dina, you should just just like do it. What's wrong with you, man? You're like on camera. You're like this bubbly, eclectic person, and you're telling me that you can't speak to a room full of people. Yeah, that's not the real deal. But that's yeah, super but, interesting. No, but like, no, what, you know, obviously, you you seeing as you network so much and you meet so many people, you pretty much know everyone on the planet, um, especially especially in this media industry. You know, YouTubers are YouTubers for a reason, and that's because we're introverts, really, and we feel comfortable with the camera at home and in the room, and that's where we really come alive. Where that really we feel like no one's watching, and it doesn't really hit you until you come on a Zoom like this. And yeah. I see little heads up top <laughs> and I'm like, I want all the picture of this. And then you start shooting yourself. So we never actually really, really think about it until until you go to an event, for example, they're like, hey, you, I watch your videos and they start telling you about your life. And I'm like, shit, did I share that? Really, I actually shared it. Because you just don't realize, isn't it? Yeah, but that's really interesting because there is a disconnect between who we decide to like portray ourselves publicly, but who we are intrinsically. And actually you are a really private person. Am I, is it fair to say that? No, I, I don't think I'm private at all. I think everyone knows everything. But like face to face. No, but naturally. No, but face to face. Wait, Neda, wait. Face to face. How many times have I met you? Maybe like twice or three times? I don't even. Well, a lot more times than that. But cool. I'm glad you remember them. That's fine. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. It's actually not a lot more times. Actually, those times I have met you, I probably shared too much of of myself or I, I probably said things I shouldn't have said or I, people wouldn't usually say to somebody on their first meeting anyway so I feel like when I meet people I can't stop talking and I say everything yeah um, but that's like a I will overshare but I, no, but I think it's because you're your feelings it's not you don't overshare about your private life you still yeah, it's very different separate. yeah maybe but I feel like I really do but yeah but like but like okay you were talking about how like youtube was a platform for you to kind of share under your own rules right inherently being quite a shy person or a private person but um would you did you ever realize that like from from where you started you'd be where you are right now um i get asked this question a lot and i've answered it really honestly and the truth is i so when when i started which was in 2000 and I don't actually know, but I was 20 or 21. I literally said to myself, I'm going to do this blogging thing. I didn't know what it, it wasn't even called blogging in my head. I was just like, I'm going to go on Facebook. I'm going to design. I'm going to share styles for like Muslim women and covering up. Yeah. And I put in my head, I was like, I'm, this is going to be my job. I'm going to be successful at it. So I didn't imagine it to be what, what it looks like today. But I did right. say to myself, this is going to be whatever it is I'm doing. Okay, so here's, here's, here's my question. And I hope you haven't been asked this as regularly. Did you ever have a conversation with your family that, hey guys, I'm doing this really public thing and a lot of eyes are going to be on me? Are you all okay with that? No. It wasn't a conversation because it, we grew with it kind of thing. So Dina would be like, as normal siblings, if Dina, we've always like filmed each other at home. Like Yusuf used to make funny little videos. We'd make funny videos at home or whatever. If Dina's taking a video, I'm going to be in the background pissing about, obviously, and like making fun of it, which is standard for a sibling. Yeah. I noticed like after years of dealing with Dina's YouTube career thing, I was basically um, I don't, in public spaces and in big groups. I just ended up being not as confident and quite anxious. And that's who I am now. So what, 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 what was the kind of what was the kind of core reason for this anxiety? Um, what, what was going through your mind in times of I, I don't know I, uh, I haven't thought about it but I think it's I, d I don't know I just feel uneasy being centre of attention or everyone staring at me and then when you especially when I wore a scarf um, people will notice you when you're out like hijabis notice hijabis so like you'll just get people staring a lot and I just felt uncomfortable because you constantly get people staring at you and then right. coming up to you and talking to you and it's just like all eyes on you all the time so if, 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 you're, if any human being sat there and someone's staring at them, they're going to start getting a, a bit uncomfortable and noticing everything they're doing. Right. So it just makes you more like hyper aware, I guess. And then then it's not only that, because it's not just people watching you, it's people constantly criticizing you online and right. talking about you. So 
Yeah. You can't, you can't get away from it. And also if I'd start a new job, because I was just leading a normal life. This is Dina's job that I'm leading, like I'm studying in the background, working, yeah. leading like an offline life. And then people that I encounter in jobs and stuff will know about me. They'll be like, yeah. oh, you're at your grandmother's on the weekend. And I'm like, sorry, who are you? What? Yeah, that's trippy. That's <laughs> super weird. That's really, <laughs> yeah. really weird. That's really weird. Dina, did you imagine? I mean, Dina, you've lived this now. I'm assuming like two thirds of your life really has been my life i'm 30 my bad yeah my math is terrible (laughs) one third one third of your life now which is like a lot right um to the point where it starts to feel like a norm um have you yeah well that's the thing it is a norm and i suppose like when i started even like just when i started let's say youtube within the first year it was normal for me to just whip out the camera and just film everything that i thought would make good content but i suppose because it felt so normal i i i feel like it felt normal to everybody else yeah, so I feel, I feel like it just felt so normal that I wouldn't have even thought to ask anybody if, hey, this is okay. But at the same time, what you mentioned earlier, um, you know, asking my family what they're comfortable with, I feel like I was, I was brought up to kind of know what's appropriate to put online and what isn't as well. I kind of knew the boundaries anyway, like I wasn't going to put yeah. anyone... Also, we didn't know what was comfortable or what yeah. wasn't because <laughs> you, don't, you don't, like, you don't know until it happens because it's not something we can't refer Absolutely. to. Absolutely. You know? 100% and that's like exactly my next point is that I guess Dina why you're uh, why you entering that world is significant with your family is that like it was uncharted territory well when I when I started on YouTube it was as a result of just a bunch of people on Facebook saying can you just show us how to do shit on YouTube and I remember going on YouTube I was like I don't know what the hell this is this is so embarrassing the fact that I'm sitting here filming myself and putting it on the internet it I felt really like awkward doing it that I would closed the door and I didn't want anyone to know that I was filming myself talking to the camera and yeah. doing like scarves and makeup and shit. I just found it really weird for a while. But then after that, obviously I got used to it. And then obviously it was great. Okay, what about like internally with your family? Were your, was there kind of a cultural element of you shouldn't be doing this or like being too familiar online or like? Yeah, obviously. So what were the kind of things that they were saying and who was it coming from? Just so in the beginning, it'd be probably my dad a little bit, uh-huh. a lot. My dad. <laughs> your your dad your dad's Egyptian, right? Yeah. So it'd be Baba. We, we call him Baba. Mainly just being like, why you got to share your life on the internet? It's disgusting. That why you got to do. <laughs> that, you know, you know that kind of. I'm sure if anyone's here who's who's like got an Egyptian dad or a Libyan dad or any North African dad, can relate to the same yeah. thing. Um, and just kind of in general criticizing all of it rather than looking at hey this is kind of cool or you know you know rather than looking at any of the positives whatsoever and while I've got these people applauding me online for doing it at home I've got my dad he he wasn't like disappointed or he wasn't like not supporting me but he wasn't entirely happy about it because he wanted you to finish uni (laughs) uni, yeah like I I didn't finish uni but then from my mum it was more of a case of like okay You've tried three three times at university now. If this is what you want to do, then stick to it and prove it to us that this is this is it. And mm. within a year, I think she she found it great. She, you know. But you got to remember as well when I first started, at least two three years, I was still working in a call center. Like it wasn't making me any money. It was pure passion and fun and creativity. So it yeah. only, I only I only be I was only able to make decent a decent wage like a living wage off it after about four or five years so yeah oh that's super interesting okay so um, obviously this world and the kind of culture that you're from affects the relationships around you but then what about the relationship that you have now with like your husband and someone that you spent the rest of your life with like um was the fact were you public by then or was your kind of image of Dina came about after your marriage no so Sid was there um free Dina free Dina Tokyo um he was I I was dating him and we were hanging out in uni and shit. And I remember calling him on the day I decided to- Totally talk. halal, totally like appropriate. Yeah, yeah, it was just, you know, you guys- halal, just, But everyone does it. Tusi was there, Tusi was there, Tusi was there kind of, you know, like just to kind of- nah, No one was there, we were to- being totally haram. But anyway. Yeah. Um, so you're, so you're, I mean, like, what I want to get is that you're, you obviously operate in a cultural environment where your dad felt uncomfortable with you being very public, but was it consistent with you seeing another guy? Like, was it like, was it, was it difficult culturally for you to see Sid? Was it like, yeah, were there barriers? But I know like, what ways was it difficult? Well, first of all, I, I, we could never have told Baba, hey, Baba, I'm seeing this guy. 
hello. <laughs> it was more of a, it was more of a, hey, I'm gonna, me and Sid were like, okay, I'm gonna tell mama. I'm gonna tell my mom, you tell your mom and they can tell the dads, obviously. So I told my mom and she was like, oh, right, what? Right, okay, we'll have to tell Barbara straight away then. So we told my dad and he was basically just like, nah, it ain't happening, honey. <laughs> Why was that? What was his like immediate objections? Um, his immediate objection. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I can't remember the exact moment Baba found out or anything. I can't actually picture it. So I'm, I'm thinking Tusi's perspective is probably a lot clearer than mine. And my brother's perspective is probably a lot clearer. When, do you know when Baba drove past you and said, was that before or after? No, he knew we would. We would. Oh, okay. that point. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I, his objection was a, a, a bunch of things. One of the first things was, you know, the fact that Sid isn't Egyptian, um, the fact that Sid hadn't graduated university just yet and he didn't have uh, a stable kind of job because he was still in university. So they, okay. they were the three main things. But the cultural, the kind of cultural barriers are quite re like relative, right? They're quite relatable, sorry. So like, you, how, what, how important was it for your father for you to be with an Egyptian? And how, and well, how serious see, did these issues get? See, I don't think it was that important for him. Mm. an Egyptian I think it was more important for him, for him for me not to be with a Pakistani actually oh yeah cool yeah. Like, tell me more about that well I mean I, that's just the vibe I get because let's face it guys right the Pakistani culture is so strong it's such a dominant culture when you put it next to for example the Egyptian one or when you put it next to for example just a British culture it's so mm -hmm. dominant and my dad in my dad's head i know for sure he was like this culture is going to take over ours and that's what he was thinking so your father at this point yes. is thinking he was concerned from his perspective that coming from quite a um, a strong um culture with a big pull could overwhelm yours and make you forget your egyptianness not even forget my egyptianness but i feel like there's a a little bit of um with amongst arabs there's well, uh, probably not now to be fair, but back in the days and with the older lot, like my dad and his friends, that kind of thing. I yeah. feel like there's a little, kind of like a stigma that, that in a lot of the Asian traditions or like cultural traditions Pakistanis have or Southeast Asians have that are not Islamic. Okay. And so that's my dad's worry, I think, because he's got, he, he's just got like the typical kind of Egyptian or North African Muslim who just thinks, we're right, we're the ones, we're the ones who are right and everyone else is wrong, right. you know? Right, and that's super interesting because it kind of, it's built on nothing really, but- It's built on perception. nothing, that's right. Right, and like, I think a lot of us like, and I, I think like no culture is particularly guilty of this more than one, another, but there yeah. is an inherent fear, especially from that generation. I think because our parents will come from migrant backgrounds where like the, the only safe option is the familiar one, right? So it would have been easy yeah. if you got with the Egyptian but yeah, it would have been difficult have that Egyptian banter together. It would have made him feel safe. It, he would have spoken to Sid's dad in Arabic. They would have, you know, watched the same Egyptian programs. They would have pronounced the Quran in the same way when they read it, when they're praying together, like a bunch of things, you know? Right. And but also this is, this was also like, we, we're the oldest, me and Dina, and this is my dad's first daughter trying to get married. So I also think but like he- With twins. No, as in like the first one that wants to get okay. married. So I think for, for him, he probably also didn't really know what he was doing do and in his yeah. family or how to deal with it in his family as well. Um, you were the first one from our family, like Sumi and Ludi and that too. Sumi wasn't, yeah. So like he had nothing to refer to and also the people around him. So his friends and that a lot of their, a lot, like they were all marrying into Egyptians and stuff. So this was all very different and new to him as well. So yeah, like he was yeah. also probably <laughs> learning. For our parents, because that's, yeah, that's, that's so true. Because for example, if you take Sid's family, for example, he wasn't the first one to get married in his family. He's got two old, old, elder sisters who were already married. And so, right. you know, they kind of just, they just know what to do next. Whereas with my mom and dad, this was a new experience for them and actually a, yeah, so I think my dad was also battling that and learning and trying to go through it and on his but was, own. But, but was it though? Like what I'm trying to get is, is that ultimately your dad married a, a an English woman, right? That's very, very normal in Egypt and very normal in that. Like it's not, it's totally, like my dad, when we had, we had this argument with my dad at the time, it was one of the main things we kept going back one to. Well, our you main, can't talk, our main point. You can't talk. Right. And then he was like, well, marry um, an Egyptian or marry someone who's English then. 
Right. So is it the case that there's like, there's almost like a sliding scale of what's appropriate for a, a young, a young girls like yourself to marry? Whereas if it was a white person, it would have been okay. It would have been cool. Cause I think um, it's, it would have to he was worried about us, the, the cultures both being too strong and them clashing. And that's like, we've got experience of the English culture and the Egyptian culture. And that's, and it, it fits quite well in Egypt. I don't know. The, I mean, Egyptian culture would probably no, dominate. No, what it is, is that they, Arab men have this idea, not just Arab men, just people who aren't British or who aren't white, have this idea that the British white culture is non-existent and they're very easy to mold. That's what it is. Mm, they're, right. not, they're easy to mold into our own culture. We can- Okay, but it doesn't, work, it, does, it doesn't work the same way if like an Egyptian woman wanted to do the same to an English man. Is there still that same acceptance? Mm. It's different, right? There's almost like different. it's always different with the, there's like with, a, there's like a, a masculine element that this is appropriate. But maybe like, you it's part of your point that with the English culture, you don't get the cultural confusion mixed with religion that you would get with the Pakistani culture that he was worried about. So yeah, a part of me, part of oh, to be honest with you, a part of me, like a part of me, just thinks this ultimately is is that there's a there's a racial preference, right? Ultimately, being white is associated with almost like a cultural step up or like a like a, a status yeah. step up as opposed to being like for example um regrettably like a lot of a lot of the people seen on the opposite end of that spectrum are black and brown people right yeah. people from south asian backgrounds people from african backgrounds like the same amnities and the same liberties are not made for these people as it is for people of like fairer skinned complexions for example yeah and in egypt i mean in general they're very racist but like but like um um, I, I, I genuinely think that, like, for, in this case of our parents, I think it's really important for us to understand that, like, these this way of thinking doesn't happen. It's just like it's a culmination or a concoction of lots of ingredients, systemic, historical, that come and force them to be that way, right? But what's really powerful, and I think Dina, I think why what's really admirable about you is that you fought back against all of that, right? Like you had all of that kind of fa family pressure, all of that doubt, all of the people telling you that this isn't going to work, but you still went about and did it. And I think if anything's going to change for our generation, it's about bravery like that to be like, no, this is a partner I want to be with. And you reflect the values that I love and you just make it happen. Yeah. Great. Next point. <laughs> 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 but like, you know, that's why that's what I see in you, Dina. And like, like, I haven't told you that one by one yet, but like, one by one. I don't think people see you and Sid on that level. And as someone who comes from a multi-ethnic South Asian Arab background as well, I love it because you're breaking that kind of pattern of, of behavior yeah. of- Well, I think we're, we're seeing it more and more now anyway. There's so many, like there's so many couples who are, you know, from, from these two different places and they just make it work, especially, like people our age, I, I like I see it. I know so many people, and it's yeah. just not an issue. Yeah. And were there any moments in both your lives to see if you could tell me like where this kind of dissonance between you being like English and Arab were there moments in your life where you, you actually quite struggled with that? Yeah, I always struggled with it actually because I just went back and forth to. I still do it actually like oh <laughs> like I was doing the other day like oh I miss Egypt and the Arab world and I miss home so much and that feels like home and then I'll like run to Egypt and I'll get there and I'll be like oh I miss the UK oh, it feels like home and I'll get there it's just like constant back and forth so like um I don't but know I hate, to, I, I, I hate to ask you this because I hate it when people ask me this like I genuinely hate it but do you feel more one or the other do you feel I'm naturally just... more inclined to one uh, no, I, at different stages in my life, um, yeah, and I guess um, it's just what you're familiar with, so it depends. I don't know. No, I honestly think I think I was talking about this with Mama the other day. We were talking about who does she, who does my mom think? Um, sorry, what side um, does she think her kids um, are more kind of like relate to the most? And we literally were talking about all of us, me, you, Spass, and you, and we. We think you're more towards the the Arabs, Egyptian, Muslim side. We definitely feel stronger, that connection stronger, a um, hundred times more. And it is literally this, the same reason why Baba didn't want me to marry Sid for the Asian culture, because that Islamic culture that we had growing up in Egypt and everything is so much stronger than what we experienced in the British, mm. yeah. our Britishness. Mm. And it's also because Mama 
Mama took on the Egyptian culture herself when she was, when we were little. She was, she yeah. literally was like an Egyptian woman, wasn't she? Yeah. But yeah, I think- She was in that culture, yeah. yeah. I, just, I just kind of feel like, I, a part of me finds it very difficult to criticize our parents' generation because the way that they think is a product of their time. But like, yeah. I don't think it's a case of like being critical of them because we will never understand the pressures of being an immigrant, the fear of being an immigrant. But what we can do is f like fight for the world that we want to build, right? And like, and like again, that's what I think your family does really well in the sense that you're navigating its multicultural kind of dynamics. And you might do that differently to say, I think you, what you said is really interesting is that at one moment you might feel really Arab, but at one moment you might feel really English. Yeah, it depends because I don't know. Yeah, it depends on what you're going through in life at different stages. I think now I'm figuring out what, um, like my own culture, but like what, as you're growing up, things that feel familiar to you are usually things that you're brought up with. So all yeah. the, so maybe like a lot of the stuff that I was brought up with, the Egyptian cultural stuff would just, yeah. would feel familiar to me as I'm growing up, like something yeah. in the back of your mind that would remind you. But yeah. then I don't, but then, but then when you analyze that stuff and you you think about what's right and what feels right to you, and then you start establishing your, your own culture, which is a mixture of those things, yeah. I think. I don't know. Yeah. I don't have a culture right now. I don't know what my culture is. But like you say this, but like every time, and you said this to me before, but you do. And like culture is just the way that you are at this present moment. But like, I feel like we're skirting around an issue, which is kind of, for me, it's very hard, especially from the cultures that we're from, between singling out what is culture and what is like religion, right? Yes. Yeah. Because, yeah. because I think this gets confused a lot. And like, um, and then people have different perspectives re regarding where you're from and how you practice it. And I too see, I remember like, meeting you for the very first time and then uh actually no even dina do you know like i think you go to me dina um are you even muslim like did I? Right? yeah yeah you said Why that like up. Such a yeah exactly <laughs> you're like you're like oh and anyway, i swear no, down I to you she was like this what she did this what you know maybe not now yeah exactly but you were you were like you looked at me and you were like oh yeah you're one of them muslims isn't it I swear to God, I swear to God. I was like, what does that mean? You're like, you know, like, look at you, like talking to girls and blah, blah, blah. You like all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I was like, what? Basically the assumption behind a statement like that is that you owned the terminology or the definition of what being a Muslim is, right? Yes, yeah, I get right? you, but I would never. But now, but now, now exactly, 100%. But do you understand how it's like, it's a, yes. it, it's, it, it alludes to a tendency that we all have that if we identify as something, it is the definition of what that thing is. Yes, and that's why right? there's so much yeah. drama on the internet in regards to Muslims. Yeah, and like actually being part of a community, any religion, any kind of spiritual tradition, it can have a variety of different ways that you practice it, right? Like yeah. it doesn't have to be one singular. And I think both of your journeys are really interesting because you've kind of ebbed and flowed yeah. in that definition, right? Especially over the last few years, right? And I think one moment, one moment <laughs> defines this transition more than ever. And I hate talking about this issue because I feel like it distills. You're gonna anyway. Yeah, we always I know, yeah, I have to <laughs> because you're both here. And I feel like if we don't talk about it, then it's a missed opportunity. But it, it's one moment in which kind of it alludes to a lot of our issues of, of how we feel between culture and spirituality and where we are between the two. And that's the moment in which you both decided to take your hijabs off right now what i would love to get is kind of a broad perspective of what exactly happened um where you were so let's so let's take us let's zoom let's kind of fast forward dina you are who you, you are your household name um both of you are known for wearing certain clothing and you've become associated with the image of your family then something changes you decide to take it off what happens dina uh <laughs> 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 well, you know, I feel like we should just change the perspective a little bit. It's not really a case of like, oh, just taking it off. It's more of a like, what do you see? Mama said this once, didn't she? She was like, it's not, well, oh, I just took it off. It's, I just decided not to wear it that day. Okay. Because it just makes it feel less of a big deal when you say that. Yeah, you know what I, mean? I agree. Um, and I feel like, I feel like that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Not such a big deal for women if they want to take it off, then it shouldn't be this huge outcry. Because I feel like, okay, there was an outcry when me and Tusi took it off, but that happens anyway with just girls who are not on the internet within their communities and at home. There's just this big dilemma about this 
the most ridiculous tiny thing where she decided to not wear her scarf. So when you think of it like that, it just mm. it reassures you a little bit. Um, mm. Because let me tell you something, it, it's not, it, it wasn't an easy decision to just, everybody just thinks, oh, you just took it off one day and you just don't care and you're, you're a carefer now and all this just outlandish stuff. But obviously I, I think people forget that it's, it's really something that consumed our lives for like a year prior to taking it off. And it was such a struggle every day, deciding and oh, debating, yeah. debating with family and Sid with my husband and whether or not I should, I should take it off and whether or not I should take it off on the internet. Do I want a death, a death sentence? Like if I, that's literally the words that we, the conversations we'd be having like, Dina, if you don't want to wear it, don't wear it, but don't do it on the internet because you will be killed off. Literally. Yeah, my mom, my mom was the most worried about, about the safety of Dina and her kids and didn't and want her to kids, do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's let's pause Dina and her journey there for a sec, and because actually it was you two C who decided to uh, uh, moment, uh, to, to stop to stop your hijab, right? Right. So it's your fault, really. I'm the influencer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but do, do, do you want to share about like your experience towards towards it and what what made you come to that decision? Um, I never really wanted to wear it. Dina wore it before me when we were younger. Um, and I just kind of wore it because I didn't want to have that conversation at some point with my dad. So I was like, oh, it's easier just to wear it. Everyone around me is wearing it. But I didn't, never liked the idea of it. I always felt like it, I, I just don't like rules. And I just felt like that's a rule that I just have to follow. And it pissed yeah. me off. Um, right. and but but you're, this is what you're doing, Tusi, right now. You're, you're, so you have to understand, Tusi. Oh. As, as a bigger picture, to see actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure you felt quite heavily that from what I understand of you is that you were, you, you felt like you were being disingenuous to how you were feeling internally wearing this hijab, right? There was yeah, because different... I never want to wear it. So then I, so when I event decided to take it off, um, I didn't decide to take it off. It just kind of happened. I'd start, I'd go I'd to- wear beanies. Basically, uh, yeah, I, I was with someone who wasn't this, from the same culture as me, he's a uh, British white culture. And for him, that stuff didn't really matter. And then I realized that it doesn't really matter. So I'd go to like the park and stuff and I'd just be wearing a hat because I'm walking the dog and whatever. And then, and, and then that just became more normal. Like I'd just go out, like not fully getting dressed like with a hijab and all that. I'd just be wearing like a hat and like trackies or whatever and take covered out for a walk. And then it just became, no one was staring at me. I just like kind of blended in and it just became, it just kind of happened. I didn't plan to take myself off. It literally just happened. It just, okay, so well, but up until that point, what had compelled you to wear it for the good 20 years of your life? I didn't, couldn't deal with uh, people, people's reaction. I didn't want to be the center of attention, even for a day at work, walking into work and everyone's like, because the hijab's always been a conversation at work with people that I'm working with that aren't Muslim. Like, oh, what's your hair? Like, oh, do you wear that? You know, all the, standard typical crap that they come out with and that that used to stress me out so I knew that because that's always part of the conversation with people I work with if I did walk in without it on everyone's going to look at me and talk right. about me but even if that's just for a day I couldn't handle that but, but but were there any spiritual associations to the fact that you were wearing this thing because that's why I think it was no, very, like... I had no spiritual connection with it whatsoever at all all right, that's interesting because then I think as a result of that it was a lot easier for you to take it off right because you didn't really understand that there was something well, I realized people. the only thing stopping me was people, people, people's perception and people talking about me and the attention. I didn't want that attention, like on yeah. that attention. And also my dad, I didn't want to upset my dad, obviously. And for him, that would be, it would just be a big hit because it's seen like in the Muslim community and stuff, it's seen as like you leaving your religion or something. And right. part, of the, part, of, part of it as well was that I just want, I was at that stage in my life, I was, I always kind of go through stages of like questioning everything like everyone does, but I was kind of questioning everything to do with what I believe in and all that stuff. And I want to strip away everything around me that would have influenced me or all these things that I felt like I want to figure out what I'd been conditioned to believe and what I actually believed. Like it was just all tangled up and I want to like strip away everything to figure out what I actually believe. Yeah. And I think like, before bringing it back to Dina, I just want to say that that takes a lot of bravery and like courage to be able to like 
regardless of all the stigma and social and the social judgment that's attached to it to actually be like, Hey, this is something that's deeply intrinsically important to me. And I want to reframe my relationship with it because it is disingenuine to have something on if it doesn't internally speak to you on the level that it's intended to. Right. I was just like, trying to be true to myself because I wasn't wearing it basically. And I, right. didn't, well, I was just wearing it for everyone else's peace, not for mine. Yeah, and I, I, can't, I can't speak for anybody else, but I actually find that as a deeply spiritual thing to do. Why? Because you're having a conversation with yourself. There's internal yeah, dialogue happening. Whereas a lot of us, regardless of whether it's hijab or whatever, we go through the motions of like what we think we need to do. And there's no conversation happening there because it becomes like programmed when actually we should ask asking ourselves, why are we doing this? Because the smaller action with more intent behind it is more meaningful than many actions with no thought behind it. So actually, I think what you did was deeply brave and spiritual and I admire you for that. Dina. Yeah. Now you have a different added dynamic because the whole world is ultimately looking at you, right? Yeah. So was there deep, was there kind of deep fear and and or intimidation to to bringing it out on that level yeah it's like i briefly said earlier it was it was a huge debate as whether or not i should even be doing that online taking it off on the internet or should i just literally lie on the internet and lead a different life online and lead a different one um not even a different life just literally look like a diff just take my scarf off offline and keep it on online for the sake of me my brand my career for the sake of all of it and for the sake of no drama and danger and death threats and all this bullshit um so it was it was a very very scary situation but i'd also just given birth to mika my second kid and i was about to turn 30 no no i had turned did i i can't remember i was gonna turn 30 or i was 29 or something and i was just like no no you were because you weren't wearing it when you when we remember no, it was, i was 29 29 29 yeah. And I was just like, I'm almost 30. Like I'm, I've never been a person who can fake shit on the internet, could never have lived this fake life on the internet and carried on without going absolutely bonkers mentally. Yeah. So yeah, for me, 100%. it was a no brainer. It was just about timing and how to do it as sensitively as possible. And you know, things don't always work out that way because I'm rash really, so. Yeah, no, and I, and I appreciate that honesty because that's real. Um, but what happened after you had done this was there was huge pushback. Cause you know what, like actually I think what you're alluding to, I agree with elements of it, right? But like what people, what I think what I'm learning is that people will come and criticize you at the point at which they are, right? But your journey and where you've arrived is a result of your life and your experiences and your internal conversations that have made you made that decision. So you might be here but someone might be on a journey that's here, right? And they can't necessarily understand you on that yeah, journey. Exactly. So if you're making if you're making a comment from here, then like they're not going to understand. You have to take them on that journey with you to be like, yeah. hey, look, this is why I, th I said what I said. This yeah. is why I think what I think. Yeah. Um, and I've made that mistake before, thinking that everyone should just bloody get it. You should just get it. Yeah. Why? Like, why are you being so stupid? When actually people are like living in the village. No, right? but also what you have to remember is maybe a lot of the audience is much much younger. Yeah, and that, 100%. Um, and I, I think that that's key. But I think throughout this whole situation with you, like um, what, what you did rightfully highlight and why I think that moment was so pivotal for your like, young identity for from, from Muslims in this country was that there is a big issue about how we treat conversations like this that are dis like, dis disrespectful, that were... Uh, vitriolic that was so bad I mean like some of the comments that were sent your way were horrific mm, yeah and like how did that affect you and your confidence and your ability as a family I mean to see seeing this online like I know like I don't really get offended when people offend me but I get really offended if you say something about someone I love uh to be honest uh when those comments came out I mean they were bad but they didn't phase me because um I've like I went through the shock of <laughs> how awful internet people can be when Dina started all this. And I, and I went through like months or years of like, whoa, how can they say that stuff? And like trying to deal with them making comments about her and my family and me. And now it's just like, I don't even give it time. Like I didn't even watch Dina's video when she read all those comments. Cause it's just, oh, it's like, I know I don't watch her videos anyway, but I don't 
um i didn't watch that video because it's stuff that i've heard before like it's 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 bad but they've constant it's been there the whole time like you constantly get attacks like that you constantly get nasty comments like that it's the same shit yeah but it, come on you're telling me it didn't affect you on some sort of deeper like internal level it must have man. Like, anything like, like we like to build walls of strength but no, i know from reading affects- comments on my way that it affects me on like no, an no, internal it level does- it's always it has affected me like it's changed it's changed me as a person as I've grown up it's completely affected me but now I don't give it any time that's what I'm saying like that's probably a defense mechanism but I don't even read like I don't even read the comments or look for them if I do see a nasty comment anywhere that I've got control of I just get rid of it without even reading it like I I don't I just don't give that stuff time anymore and at that time when Dina was going through that the only thing that worried me or stressed me out was um any actual real life damage or harm that could happen. Yeah, like real threats. Or the kids, like real threats. The comments were just like very yeah. much expected. Like I, I was like, well, what, what that's going to happen. We all knew that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, the other stuff that we were worried about. So that's what stressed me out and worried me more than anything. Yeah, um, I, think, I, th- I think like damn right, obviously. And I think what that showed was, was like actually how deeply septic our communities are. For me, the issue isn't whether or not you took your hijab off. Personally, I don't give a shit, right? That's your life. And I'm sure majority of people out there really like, when I like, call cool, Dina, you do you, as long as you're happy, right? Um, what is an issue for me is the reaction from when someone who has their own ability to make the choices for their own life, do you, go ahead. But the way that we come out and say the things that we say when people has made a decision about how to live their own life is horrific. And I think what we really need to kind of highlight is that there is no excuse for anyone to receive the kind of abuse I think that you guys got in a situation like that because it was horrible to read like and like I can imagine like after that walking into like a social gathering it would give you like you know like anxieties or like you know weird kind of feelings of do people hate me is someone who threatened me in this space all this kind of stuff right the thing is they, they've always been like that and they've all that a, a lot of Dean's audience like we've we've received this sort of behavior from them before and that's for me that's part of the reason I even took my scarf off to get away from all that but like and to be free to be free of it and also you've got to remember they're like like you said before they're super young they're from like different cultures different communities a lot of these people might be behaving that way because that's how they've been brought up so that's how they're being spoken to by people around them and that's all they Mm -hmm. know and that's not something like we can it's actually quite sad and I think the only the only way that can change is by doing things like this like you're doing having conversations and allowing people to listen to the conversation and get and reach the like to understand rather than just seeing things and reacting to it uh it must have been quite difficult because even like even I noticed that you were quite rattled did you yeah yeah and like you know what you know what was you two you know okay look let me just why I really wanted to get you both on here right and I, I didn't even tell you this when I, when I prepositioned this, is that I had the fortune of knowing you guys privately, right? And whether we like it or not, when you're someone in the public, there is a persona that we decide to put on, right? And you might not think so, but even you, Dina, who likes to think you're 100% authentic, there is a veil. There is, a, it might be thin. Yeah, 100%, no, there is. Of course, it's natural, right? And like, the thing is, is that the way that the conversation has been had with regards to you guys and your family, is um is i feel like you do something you're attacked for it and because you guys are like strong and like you you don't take that kind of bullshit you fight back and it's just this back and forth back and forth back and forth when actually you guys would say things which hold profound meaning but it's not conveyed in a way that like would express that as well as it can be because of this weird argument that's happening right and like when I see you two, I actually see you two as people who have really shaped and inspired a lot of young people to kind of think around their spirituality in really meaningful ways. Because a lot of young girls are going through this, and I, I can't even speak to them as a man because it's experiential and I don't know what it's like. But like, it's encouraged a lot of people to start thinking about why am I wearing this? What is this relationship? Well, with me? that's exactly that's the reason that brought me to take it off. Because when Tuesday took it off, I was like is this a thing? Am I actually allowed to do this? I literally thought that in my head. I was like, can I do this? Am I allowed? And then I obviously thought to myself, well, Tusi can do it. So obviously this is a thing. And why am I wearing it? I literally said to myself, hold on, if, if my mom had never worn this, if my mom had never worn this and my sister never wore, worn it, would I ever put it on? And the answer was no. 
I would have never yeah. put them on. So I was like, yeah. why am I wearing this now? Am I wearing this? You wore it before me anyway. You wanted to wear it, remember? You and Alec. Yeah, but I was 11, like, you know. But, yeah, but, but so, it, got to a point where, it got to a point where I was like, am I literally going to keep this on because I'm due to Tokyo and I need, and I need, I've built this career and if I take it off, who am I? Or am I just going to take it off because I don't want to wear it and deal with what happens? So okay, so what do you, what do you say to people who say to you that you've literally, everything that you've, all the rewards you're, you're reaping right now are a result is are a result of you associating yourself as a hijabi, right? So for you to say the things that you have said is um, not cool because look, yeah, where the community that cool. gave you? It's not cool, but at the same time, when I said them, I was still a hijabi. So I'm allowed to say that because I am part, I am one and I've experienced it and I've lived it. And I was a hijabi for almost 20 years. So I got every right to say what, what I want to say about it because I was one and I lived it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's I your know, experience. I know, 100%. About, I know more about being one than like someone who's worn it for a year, for example. Yeah. What it's like to be one from a young age and to have the pressure of wearing it every day. And if you yeah. take it off, you're, you're a her or whatever. Yeah. You know and I, I got... So for people who say, oh, well, you know, you, you hate it. I don't hate it. I love wearing the hijab. I still love doing turban styles. And it just means different things to me now. But the... The point is, if I wore it when I was 11, when I was 11, 12, 13, I didn't sit here thinking, oh, this is going to make me who I'm going to be at 30. It's going to get me all this money because it wasn't a thing back then. So people yeah. aren't, aren't thinking deep enough or logically enough when they come out with that statement. And it just pisses me off, to be frank. Yeah, no, definitely. I think Hanan has, has written a legitimate point that like, I'm just sick of tired of Muslim women and their bodies being fetishized. Yeah, um and scrutinize for whatever we do and it's just like ridiculous. even a topic of conversation now Nedja. i know this was this was the dichotomy <laughs> though right but this was like this was the dilemma it was like this was such a monument this was such a monumental moment for a lot of people that it's become a, a, a reference right of like how do we negotiate this better so how okay th this is proactive and this is positive that whole situation how could we have done it better what would you have liked to have seen in an ideal world you're thinking about taking your hijab off. How would you have liked for people to respond to you? Well, uh, so people responded to me because of how I kind of did it. So, you know, they just, they were angry, they were confused because also it's a little bit like what I'm doing now on Zoom. I'm just talking, thinking everyone already knows the backstory about things when obviously they don't. And that was kind of the same idea I had with, with how, I, what, how it kind of happened on the internet. I just assumed people kind of know how I'm thinking and what I'm yeah. and what, what I'm going through because I share so much already, but then you don't realize that you you need to share it literally from the beginning in a timeline in one in one piece of media for people to look at and get their answers. Yeah. Um, but it didn't happen like that in my head, so it was loads of back and forth, and I was, you know, like for for us to come to that decision of taking it off anyway was was such a it was like it was so complex on so many different levels as that it's hard for us to navigate that on the internet and showcase it the best we can when it's not even straightforward in our own heads no know? and 100 percent. and i think that's a really powerful point is that like you're still figuring it out but you yeah. have to do it on such a public scale exactly. and then to be like berated and your confidence knocked yeah even now I don't, I don't quite understand what i'm thinking about it and even right. now i'm gonna right. get off this call and be like shit what did i say who's gonna dissect what and yeah yeah it up and say dina said this yeah but you know yeah but like the, the fact that you kind of caveated that with like you're figuring it out and like all of us we can relate to that whether you're male female muslim or not like we're on our spiritual journeys and some of us will have a very different turning points at different times and be humble enough to know that you don't know what the answer is yeah. but like for you on this journey is is do you, do you still feel like you have a relationship with this piece of clothing is there still a relationship that exists do you feel like it has spiritual significance and i'm kind of asking this question on behalf of armin as well personally i i don't i mean i do because when i pray i put it on but like on a day-to-day -day, i don't feel like it, it's it's like before i used to put it on and i'd be like yeah i'm muslim i'm one of the good ones and yeah. like which is obviously completely wrong, but you know, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Literally, it was giving me pride. Yeah, because you, you, we were always told that, okay, even if you're not, um, you know, religious in other ways, or you, you kind of, everyone goes, you know, through phases and they're religious and not religious, keeping yeah, it on is at least, least on. at least keeping it on. And it's like a reminder and it's like the minimum. And you know what? I, I do, 
although I never want to wear it like everything happens for a reason I think and I don't regret wearing it really because looking back it protected me from a lot I was really rebellious and it stopped me it put me it protected me from a lot in loads of situations that could have been a lot worse if I was if I wasn't wearing it and yeah. when yeah. we did wear it we be, like I'd either wear it or wouldn't wear it I I never like when I wore it the whole time I wore it I never ever took it off it's not like I wore it and then sometimes took it off on holiday or took it off around certain people like I literally it was glued to me like I did yeah. I never we we wore it fully all the time so yeah it means that when I did want to rebel and do certain things, I had to make that, I knew that I wasn't going to take it off. So it protected me from a lot. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I love that. I would a different person. So in the interest of time, so the interest of time, um, I'm going to open up the, the questions. So if you want to ask a question, you have to write it in this box and then just literally uh, put brackets private if you want me to read it out for you. But if you would like to share it publicly, then just put public. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Dina, do you think like, do you think, and then this is to Tawab's point, who she she wrote down something in the chat box that like maybe we should aspire to have a fluid relationship with uh, hijab and any piece of religious clothing that it shouldn't just be glued to your head if you wear it. But if there are times where you feel like, yeah, sorry, I feel ahead. like if I if I was brought up, not if I was brought up, maybe I don't know, because this is this is the case for a lot of people, by the way, um, for a lot of women, and this is what I'm intending to do with my kid Hannah. Like if she suddenly she makes like a friend who's a hijabi and she wants to wear it, wear it. I'm going to fully support her. But if after one week, she's like, I don't want to wear this actually. I'm going to be like, yeah, fine, take it off. And then if she wants to put it back on again, the next month, we'll be like, go for it, girl. Like it shouldn't be a, if you put it on, it's a forever situation. And if, and then if you take it off, it's a big problem and you're going to literally be like villainized. It shouldn't be that. That should not be the case. It should be literally what the web said. It should be fluid and it should be very normal. You know, one day you want to wear it, one day you don't feel like wearing it, say one day you want to do turban. It shouldn't be an issue. Mm. Yeah, and, I love that. And, and that's how we we will change it now. If any of anyone who's watching has a kid and a daughter, that's how we should do it so that they don't grow up with these weird complexes and hang-ups about the hijab and these weird ideas like, oh, I'm a good Muslim because I've worn it and she's, she's a slut because she's not wearing it. All this dumb shit that we literally grew up with. And it yeah. took years to unlearn all of this. Yeah, yeah. It took until like last year to unlearn all this. And I think it's all down to reputation and, and perception, which is totally wrong anyway. I feel like why so much focus on how you look to other people and the reputation of a family? And yeah. that's what the scarf represents. And that's how I felt it represented. It's like, oh, but other people will talk. And that's... Yeah, our reputation as a family think, will yeah, be... Yeah, and I think yeah. it's like, yeah. and spirituality and religion shouldn't be about that. It should be focusing on characteristics of you as a person, whether you're... Like I should, you should focus on whether that person's a good person, has like, you know, a strong heart, has a good like relationship with their, with their mental health and things like that, rather than, you know, just wearing something to look a certain way to other people. And that's all it, that's probably why I didn't have a relationship yeah. with it because that's all it was to me. Yeah, I think that's powerful. I think that's powerful. There's two things I wanted to ask you was one, like, why are people like making you that ambassador for hijab in the first place? Like you're just a YouTuber from Wales for Cardiff who's just making YouTube videos like if they wanted to have like legitimate sources to to understand that there are people who are more knowledgeable of it right like yeah. you're just on your journey doing what you do so why do we place emphasis and focus on people who don't deserve that title right like yeah. ultimately that's what it boils down to um another thing I wanted to ask is whether you have like a like a traumatic connection to it now as a result of everything that's happened is there like a visceral reaction um or, or, or like uh both of you i guess but like either of you answer if it resonates but like do you have does it make you feel away every time like you you have to talk about it or or it makes, me, about it it makes me feel away when i think about um having to talk about it on the internet yeah 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 do you feel like you've not been able to do that in a way that's conducive to a good conversation i feel like i was close to doing it Myself. We haven't been able to have like a raw, open conversation about it yet. Online. I think it's, it's about timing because there was always something stopping me because I've got, I've filmed many times my story and the reasons I've done everything, trying to explain, dissecting everything. But there's just something yeah. that's always stopping me from uploading it still yeah. to now. And I don't actually know why I've done this today. Yeah. Come to think of it right now. I think it's just hit me. Why the fuck am I here talking about this? <laughs> but why? Do you not feel like that a lot of lessons have come out of it as a result? I mean, not for me. I know all this shit anyway, but if it's helped anyone else, great. 
hundred percent. And I think it has for you. I think there's a realization that like, you know, I think all of us with like platforms have an ability to be like, Hey, how could we have done this better? And I think like, I like, I like part of that responsibility is learning a bit about our past and being like, okay, look, these are ways in which we navigate it very differently. And I think your journey has inspired a lot of people to look at their own journeys in very interesting ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right i'm gonna i'm gonna just ask a few questions that people here are asking on the right um one question is from um armin i'll read this out actually no i won't i'll do afra do you think you would get backlash from non-muslims who understand hijab even less than the muslim community so it would attract even more questions yeah definitely that's do you ever think you will wear hijab again? Do you now feel triggered by what it means to publicly now? Do you see? Do you feel like you'd ever wear wear hijab again? Again? Uh, I don't know. I mean, hijab means something different. Something totally different. I guess. To it doesn't mean what I thought before. It was just a piece of cloth on your head. But for me, it, it means a lot more. It's a lot more about your character and loads of just modesty in general. So I think I don't. I don't really know who's. Maybe I'm wearing it. Yeah, that's no, okay. but you don't know if I you're going to wear. I'll wear. I don't wear the piece. I won't wear. I don't know if I'll wear a piece of cloth on my head again outside. But I don't know. Who knows? No, but, but, you but know, that... for example, if we go to Eid prayer, you're going to put a scarf on your head. No, as in like wear it as in all the time, like as in lifestyle, as in lifestyle. I, I don't think I'm going to like, stick to it twenty four seven again. But that's a good point, right? I think Tusi, what you've said is like this is what I mean by internal dialogue. You've come to like, for you, you're, you're like, how do I embody mo modesty that encompasses more than just a piece of cloth, right? And like, that's the conversation you're having. And that's really interesting. That's what you're saying. Yeah, because, yeah, because we looked into it a lot and about that, that would take, yeah, we could talk about that for that's hours. Other yeah, it's a whole other. Yeah, yeah, but like, yeah, that, yeah. that's the point. I think if we want everyone yeah. to start thinking about actually so much more than just like um, a cloth. Um, all right, so next question is, um, do you think it's highly gendered? And if the conversation itself, like them as successful complex women still are talking about their outward presentation, is it a patriarchal opinion about what you um, need to be? This is funny because when I, when I was talking to my dad after taking it off and we'd argue about it a lot and he'd like try and persuade me, you know, to put it back on and all this stuff, I'd always, I'd, I'd get really, stressed out and passionate about it and I'd just be like you don't understand I was like I okay I've been working I've, I'm working in, in all different industries I worked in like the financial industry and le legal industry and now like uh, tech but like all these different industries that are like male dominated and and with all these like all this hierarchy and then a Muslim woman coming in with a hijab on is difficult enough and I was like you don't understand how hard it's been and you're like discounting everything that I've done wearing a hijab and you're saying you know you're you're telling me to put this on but you can walk outside and you can get away with being like a greek guy or an italian guy you know you're this tall dark you know man that could get away with being <laughs> and, and, that could get away with being whatever you want to be and that and you feel okay in religious and everything because you're doing that and you're trying to impose this piece of cloth on me that's a mass like i outwardly go out there and i'm i'm fighting that battle i'm on the front line you're not you can go out and you're not you're not you're not growing a massive beard and wearing like a big long um you know looking outwardly muslim when you're going out you're wearing a t-shirt and jeans and that's okay for you because you're covering what you're supposed to cover whereas yeah. i have to go out and literally be on the front line and be and everything's in the news that's happening and i have to go into work every day and deal with whatever's being thrown at me or you know yeah. when i'm applying for a job i have to deal with the judge the judgment or yeah. even in the muslim community outside of it we're on the front line the women are shouldn't you be protecting women then as part of islam so 100 percent. like i don't 100%. understand how you're pushing them to dress a certain way when it's hard enough for them to go about their daily lives yeah. work go out and feel safe or do anything yeah. and and so like you're contradicting yourself so i just get super stressed out about that with my dad yeah all the time. but that, i think that's really i think that's really powerful i think like there is a gender dynamic here there is like an element of patriarchy and like how men think women should do xyz which is why i think it's really important for us to like hear that but as a man um how would you like to see men respond to this issue in a more appropriate way i would i would like to see no response yeah that's interesting that's what i would like just no opinion no response i don't even like you know, I, I got some guys on YouTube being like, oh, we applaud Dina. We're not here to judge her. She can go out naked if she wants. That in itself is an issue. 
Like, why do you think your opinion? I think it's your opinion is important to me. It's so important that you need to. Like, your opinion on the way I dress. Like, why? We don't realize you guys have to dress. Like, oh, Ned, you shouldn't be walking around with those shorts on. Like, what? Never happens. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I get you 100%. So, so. Even a, even an, op- uh, an opinion that might seemingly agree with you is it, is patronizing and it's annoying yeah. and it pisses me off. All I'm right. you, it really really annoys me. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I think a lot of the men here. Mansplaining. Somebody said mansplaining. That's exactly what <laughs> mansplaining. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So I so I guess so you're basically you're basically telling anyway any man who sees themselves as an advocate or an ally should just shut up. Yeah, because yeah, like, just shut up and be supportive to the women in your life. Be yeah, you support the women in your life yeah. and be be there for them and bring them up in a safe environment where they feel safe to be themselves and have those conversations with you. That's what you can do for women. Yeah, not, yeah. not go and watch other women yeah. and, and then give your opinion to them, women that have nothing to do with you. Right, and, but like, and, can I just say, what, what what about the issue of like sometimes your biggest critics will be women themselves? What does that What does that say? What does that? How do you negotiate that? I, 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 so my opinion on that is because I've been that woman, literally, not vocally, but in my head, I have judged other women and been like, oh, but this. And now as I've gotten older, I literally, it's come from a, from what I've been taught from a man. I'm telling you now. That's interesting. Dina, that's really interesting. It is a, it is a place is when you think about everything we've learned and Islamically and community, it's always coming from a man. And the way we brought up, it's always. Yes. Yes. I see it now with Hannah, not not with religion or anything, but for example, it's just watching Disney shit. You know, it's all ingrained yeah. from a from a young age. It's literally a man's world, and it still is. Hundred percent. Probably just because of the cartoons that are on the telly. Do you know what I mean? Hundred percent. It's like we, hundred percent, are like almost like a, a young girl can internalize the misogyny that she experiences yeah, and like project that outside. Actually, if she was to actually sit there and think, when she's older, for example. Yeah. Do what do I want to do, regardless of if it's gonna piss this guy off or my dad yeah. off, my uncle off, my uncles off. What do I want to do? She is not gonna want to. Yeah. Like she ain't like yeah. She yeah, doesn't yeah. want to do that shit. No yeah, one I, does. I was having this conversation with my, my mother, and and someone had said to her, uh, "Well, why don't women go and become like learned and scholars, and then start teaching in a way that women do?" But that's a dumb question because actually, like, there's no access or or entry points so very limited very very limited so of course like the numbers are going to be totally skewed and when, what it does when is a just... woman does that she get she just gets questioned on how credible she is yeah that's yeah. what happens 100 100 totally whoa we've done a lot today damn i'm gonna kind of save dina and Tusi for a bit now i'm gonna put oh, it yeah, on dina and Tusi throughout your whole journey from the past up until now Let's start with you two. Through everything that you've learned, um, what is one of the biggest, but Dina, I'd love to end on your whole journey. If there's been one takeaway or one lesson that you've learned, what would you say it is? Uh, I would say that I'm still, I'm learning things every day and I haven't learned anything that's hugely profound. I'll be honest with you, because I've just kind of grown up. Not grown up, but I've lived my whole twenties on the internet and I'm just, like changing as a person spiritually mm-hmm. every week to be fair and sorry it can't get much deeper than that no but i think there's a lot of humility uh, see this is where you need to start looking at yourself and actually see that there's a lot of humility in that and i appreciate <laughs> that um thanks for coming in i thought i thought we behaved ourselves i think we <laughs> Was, yeah, I, I think, I, I, <laughs> nothing too crazy, guys. We want to thank you so much for your time. Um, we really appreciate you having um, spent your Wednesday girls, evening with us, not guys. Girls, my bad, my bad. Thanks for checking me. I appreciate that. Um, but hopefully, um, it's not the end, and I, I think all of us have learned a lot. Um, but thank you for coming. Really, 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 really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Dear, are you guys? Wait, wait, are you guys? Are you, are you guys? You guys gonna come back? Right, right, right. Yeah, why not? I don't yeah, know. but this time it will be more of a conversation, yeah. and we'll actually make you a part of it as well. Oh wow! Okay, okay. no, I like to rip the part, guys. Oh, that I like. Sick. I like. I like asking the question. Someone needs to rip <laughs> It's easy being the one here, being like, "Uh, oh, you should have done this better. You should have done that better. But actually, it's a lot. Uh, no, I appreciate the bravery it takes to be on the hot seat. 
but yeah appreciate you guys so do we log out now yeah well, you can piss off now <laughs> see you later uh thanks for joining guys it's Bye. been another episode of caravan sarai thank you Tusi. thank you dina for being here we appreciate you a lot everyone Pleasure. wave and say bye to dina and Tusi. give them a wave thank you very nice much to start. Bye. thanks see you soon bye okay, guys Woo. ah man that was a lot that was a lot i personally learned a lot um Ooh. yeah man i hope you guys enjoyed that there was a lot there and i kind of still digesting it um it was at times it was really intense at times it was really like weird and like awkward but that was the nature of like authentic real conversation i hope you appreciated it on that level thank you so much for the insightful things that really helped me actually I kind of direct the conversation in ways that you guys wanted it to go i wish you guys asked questions at the end man like i kind of feel really like bad that like i i take a lot of the airtime. like i really want to encourage you guys to contribute and be part of the conversation as much as possible armin is putting his hand up do you want to say something armin yeah hi guys i just wanted to um you asked like why we haven't asked questions and seriously i felt like at a certain point it got a little bit too aggressive like to ask a question when it went in the direction then i said why should i give this to myself like in the end like i don't know but aggressive on like uh, wait uh, aggressive on which way do you mean aggressive in 